Welcome to Trench Diaries. This is Battleship Bismarck, part 18. Like everyone else on board, I knew nothing of the reconnaissance activities in which the Royal Air Force's Coastal Command was engaged during the night of May the 25th to the 26th. At the beginning of May 1941, 17 US Navy pilots were sent to Great Britain under the strictest secrecy. The United States was not at war with Germany at this time and distributed among the flying boat squadrons of Coastal Command. Their mission was to familiarize the Royal Air Force with the American-built Catalina flying boat, some of which had been put at the disposal of the British government under the provisions of the Land-Lease Act. The arrangement was also to give the American pilots operational experience for the benefit of the US Navy. With a wingspan of 35 meters, the Catalina had what was at the time the unusually long range of 6,400 kilometers. At 0300 hours on May the 26th, two of them left their base at Lough Anne in Northern Ireland on a far-reaching search into the Atlantic for Bismarck. One of them was Catalina Z of Squadron 209. Its pilot was a Briton, flying officer Dennis Briggs, its co-pilot an American, Ensign Leonard B. Smith. Around 10-15 hours in poor visibility and low-lying clouds, Smith saw a ship that he took to be Bismarck but could not be absolutely certain. Briggs maneuvered the plane into a position for better observation. From an altitude of 700 meters and at a distance of 450 meters a beam, Smith saw the ship again through a hole in the clouds. Was it Bismarck? Minutes later, the Catalina began to transmit one battleship bearing 240 degrees, 5 miles, course 150 degrees, my position, 49 degrees, 33 minutes north, 21 degrees, 47 minutes west. Time of origin, 10.30 hours 26. The message showed Tavi how narrowly Bismarck had been missed the previous day. The Rodney and her destroyer screen had missed her by some 50 nautical miles, the cruiser Edinburgh by around 45 nautical miles. A flotilla of British destroyers had crossed Bismarck's wake at a range of only 30 nautical miles. Now, the King George V was 135 nautical miles to the north, Rodney 125 nautical miles to the northeast, and Renown 112 nautical miles to the east-southeast of the German battleship, which was still 700 miles from Saint-Nazaire. Bismarck maintained course and speed towards the west coast of France. As the night passed had been, the early morning hours of May the 26th were quiet. At 10.25 Group West radioed Lutyens that our own aerial reconnaissance had started as planned, but that weather conditions in the Bay of Biscay prevented air support from going out. Thus, for the time being, we could not expect air cover until we were close to shore. Suddenly, around 10.30 hours, a call came from the bridge. Aircraft to port! Aircraft alarm! All eyes turned in the direction indicated and a flying boat was indeed clearly visible for a few seconds before it disappeared into the thick, low-lying clouds. As soon as it reappeared, we opened well-directed anti-aircraft fire. It turned away, vanished into the clouds and was not seen again. We assumed that it was staying in the cover of the clouds so that it could continue to observe us and report our position, preferably unseen. For a while, the bridge considered sending our Arado planes up against the Catalina. But because of the risks that would be incurred in recovering the float planes in such heavy seas, Lindemann would not allow them to be launched. Our intelligence service team speedily decoded the Catalina's reconnaissance report and at 11.56 Group West radioed it to Lutyens as well. It said, English aircraft reports to the 15th reconnaissance group, 10.30, one battleship, course 150 degree, speed 20 knots, my position is 49.20 north, 21.50 west. We had been rediscovered. Obviously, the flying boat had come from a land base a long way away, which led me to assume that it might be a long time before there were any perceptible reactions to its report. But I soon found out that I was wrong. As early as noon, only an hour and a half after our encounter with the Catalina, Lutyens radioed Group West about the appearance of another aircraft. The report said, Enemy aircraft maintains contact, wheeled aircraft, my position, approximately 48 north, 20 west. A wheeled aircraft. So there must be an aircraft carrier quite nearby. And other, probably heavy ships would be near her. Would cruisers or destroyers pick up contact before we ran into them? And were we now to experience a new version of our happily ended pursuit by the Suffolk and Norfolk? We in the Bismarck had the realization forced upon us that, that another page had been turned. 
After 31 hours of almost unbroken contact, 31 hours of broken contact had now, perhaps for good, come to an end, an exactly equal number of hours, how remarkable. But did the carrier plane really signify a decisive turn of events? Morale sagged a little among those who could read the new signs. Of course, we did not know then that the appearance of the carrier aircraft was not simply the visible result of the Catalina's reconnaissance. We had no idea that the radio signals transmitted by Lutyens the morning before had led the enemy to us. The two signals, the second of which was especially useful to enemy direction finding stations ashore because of its length, became of interest when the operation was evaluated in Germany. At the time of their transmission, however, they were of no operational consequences. They only helped seal the fate of the ship and her crew. The dummy stack still lay where it was built on the flight deck. It had not been rigged and I have not heard a logical reason why not. If it was to serve its purpose, we would have had to set it up when we are out of sight of the enemy so that the next time they saw us, they would immediately think they were seeing a two-stack ship. Instead of playing our trick, we confirmed our identity by firing at the enemy aircraft. As we know today, we even spared him the trouble of making completely sure who we were. So we had decided in advance not to try our ruse or our prepared radio messages and I could imagine only that this decision had something to do with the attitude of the fleet staff. They probably decided that the overall situation, which they sensed to be increasingly precarious, made it useless to try to camouflage ourselves. There was neither time nor opportunity to ask questions, so I kept my speculations to myself. During the afternoon a Catalina flying boat joined the weird aircraft that was holding contact with us. It was the partner of our discoverer, which had earlier been obliged to break off the operation because of its fuel supply. The Catalina circled back and forth over our wake for a long time, out of range of our anti-aircraft batteries. Occasionally the planes tried to come closer to us, but each time they were driven off by our flak. The bridge announced that an aircraft carrier was in the vicinity and all lookouts were to pay particular attention to the direction in which the wheeled aircraft disappeared, so that the position of the carrier could be ascertained. The flying boat vanished around 1800 hours, but the carrier plane stayed with us and was soon joined by the cruiser Sheffield, which had newly arrived on the scene. At 1824, Lutyens reported the Sheffield's position to Group West, giving her course as 115 degrees and her speed as 24 knots. At 1903 he radioed Group West, Fuel situation urgent. When can I count on replenishment? The question must certainly have puzzled its recipients. Knowing as little as they did about the situation of the Bismarck, how could they tell him when and where a supply tanker could be deployed in the midst of the area of operations? It did not become clear until later that Lutyens was only trying to tell them that his fuel supply was critical. In order to keep his transmission brief, he used the so-called short signal book for encoding, which permitted a report of the fuel situation to be given only in combination with a question about replenishment. It is also of interest in this connection to recall the signal, also encoded in short signal format, sent by Prince Eugen, which Lutyens had detached to conduct independent operations to report a similar fuel problem on May the 25th. It said, fuel situation urgent, my position is. As the result of the signal, immediately received by Group West, Prince Eugen and the tanker Spichern were directed to a meeting point, so that the cruiser could take on fuel the very next morning. If Bismarck had used the same short signal group, that is, including her position, the battleship's approximate location would have become known to Group West, although, of course, the operational situation would have made it impossible for her to refuel. But the knowledge of the ship's approximate position would have been of value to Group West in planning the measures it initiated to assist Bismarck. In the meantime, several of the British ships were forced by their dwindling fuel supplies to abandon the pursuit towards the west coast of France. The Prince of Wales, the Victorious, their escorting destroyers and the Suffolk dropped out of the race. The Norfolk, having been convinced from the start that Bismarck was making for Brest, did not take the search course to the north and was consequently in a quite favourable position. The Rodney was even more advantageously placed. She had proceeded on the same assumption as the Norfolk, but was too far to the south at the start ever to have joined in a pursuit to the north. The positions of the Rodney and Norfolk were only relatively favourable, however, because like the King George V, they were much too far behind the Bismarck on course for France to be any threat to her unless her speed were significantly reduced. When the hunt began, the Ramillies was not unfavourably placed, but she was withdrawn on account of her age and lack of speed. 
At the moment then, to attack the German battleship as soon as possible, Tavi had only Somerville's force H, which was to the south. This task force and Tavi's had been steaming virtually towards one another since May the 24th. In the beginning, Tavi thought Force H was too far to the south to be able to take part in the pursuit. Now, it was the only force that was in a position to stop Bismarck. And that was certainly not because it included the Renown and the Sheffield. The loss of the Hood had shown the folly of pitting such ships against Bismarck unless they had the support of heavier forces. It was upon the aircraft of the Ark Royal that he would have to rely. Their job was to cripple Bismarck with their torpedoes so that Tavi's own big ships could come up for a decisive engagement. A situation that had to be created at once because he was getting ever nearer to the effective range of the Luftwaffe. Tavi was aware that this was his one and only chance to avoid the barren alternative of calling off the days long pursuit through the Atlantic. He had to remind himself that the attack by the planes of the Victorious on May the 24th had not been successful, but their crews were young and inexperienced, whereas the Ark Royal had the best trained and most experienced air crews in the Royal Navy. With them, the prospects would be much better. Since the morning of May the 25th, Somerville had been going on the assumption that Bismarck was heading for Brest. On the basis of running reports on the position of the German battleship, he launched 10 of the Ark Royal swordfish for reconnaissance on the morning of May the 26th. Six other swordfish, equipped with auxiliary fuel tanks to increase their range, joined them. They were to shadow Bismarck once she had been found. Following their launching around 0830, nothing was heard from them for two hours. Then, around 1030, the radio men in the Renown and Ark Royal recorded an incoming message. It said, one battleship bearing 2405 miles, course 150 degrees, my position 4933 north, 2147 west. It did not come, as the people in the carrier hoped, from one of the swordfish, but from the Catalina. This did not diminish the warmth of its welcome, and when the Catalina lost contact after being fired on by Bismarck, it was a swordfish that found the battleship again and maintained contact. Thereafter, Somerville's objective was an aerial torpedo attack on Bismarck. The first opportunity to launch from Ark Royal came in the early afternoon and, regardless of the stormy weather, 15 swordfish took off at 14.50. Around the same time, he sent the Sheffield to maintain contact with Bismarck because, with the weather deteriorating, it seemed to him risky to depend on observation from the air. Unaware that the Sheffield had been given this mission, the skipper of the Ark Royal, Captain Loben E. Mond, told his pilots that there would not be any ship in view between the Ark Royal and Bismarck. Consequently, when they detected a ship on their radar, they dived through the clouds and launched their attack. Only three of the pilots at the last moment recognized their faithful old target ship Sheffield and withheld their fire. Defects in their magnetic detonators caused most of the torpedoes that were launched to explode harmlessly upon entering the water. Fortunately, by putting on full speed, Sheffield avoided the handful of torpedoes that ran well. Nevertheless, the air crews returned to the Ark Royal in a gloomy mood and were consoled only by the promise that they would be launched again that evening. In spite of the gloom, the incident had its bright side in that it revealed the failure of the magnetic detonators. For the next attack, the swordfish fell back on their old, reliable contact detonators. For Tavi, who had not been told that the planes had mistaken the Sheffield for Bismarck, the Ark Royal's report of an unsuccessful attack was bitter news. He had little reason to think that another attack that same evening would be successful. Once more, he reviewed the whole situation. Unless Bismarck could somehow be crippled on the night of May the 26th, on the morning of May the 27th, she would have as good as escaped. In other words, an attack that evening would be the very last chance. Considering the continuing deterioration of the weather, he did not expect much from a night attack by the destroyers. Also, both King George V and Rodney were reaching the limits of their fuel endurance. Unless the next few hours brought a decisive change, King George V would have to drop out of the race. At 18.20, Tavi signaled Somerville that if Bismarck's speed was not reduced by midnight, King George V would have to turn away to refuel. Rodney, he said, could continue the pursuit without destroyers if need be. It was hard for Tavi to send that signal. For four days and nights, over 2,000 nautical miles, he had pursued Bismarck from the Denmark Strait almost into the Bay of Biscay with a great body of ships. Should this tremendous effort really have been for nothing? At 1700 hours, Sheffield made out the German battleship at the limit of visibility. 
for the first time since the Suffolk, Norfolk and Prince of Wales had lost contact one and a half days ago, a ship had visual contact with Bismarck. Sheffield did everything she could to avoid being seen by us. Her mission was only to help the second wave of carrier planes find the target and to maintain contact. In the Ark Royal, hasty preparations for a second attack were being made. For one thing, the torpedo's magnetic detonators were replaced by contact detonators. There was so much to be done that the originally intended launching time of 1830 slipped. It was 1915 when, under low cloud cover and in varying visibility, 15 swordfish were launched, one after the other, into the wind. Around 2000 hours they appeared over the Sheffield. She directed them, but wrongly at first because in 30 minutes they were back without having sighted the target. Directed anew, they flew off again and the sound of the German anti-aircraft fire that soon followed told Sheffield that this time they had gone in the right direction. Daytime on the 26th passed into early evening. Twilight fell and, as far as we and Bismarck were concerned, the dark of night could not come too soon. In spite of our experience as the object of the enemy's unerring means of reconnaissance, we were still inclined to feel nighttime brought some protection. Of course, ever since a Catalina rediscovered us that morning, a wheeled aircraft had maintained almost uninterrupted contact. Its presence indicated that a carrier was nearby, but eight hours had now passed and, to our surprise, we had not been attacked. Not having any means of knowing that the swordfish had lost time by mistakenly attacking the Sheffield instead of us, we began to speculate. Could the wheeled aircraft be a reconnaissance plane with extraordinarily long range? Was the carrier too far away to launch an attack? Might we be spared one today, May the 26th? Below, the men's good spirits had returned and morale was high throughout the ship. Word had spread that an enemy force was about 100 nautical miles astern of us, but unless it was much faster than we were, how could it possibly overtake us? Some men poured over charts and calculated that the next morning we would be 200 nautical miles off the coast within range of the Luftwaffe's protection. A report circulated that a tanker was on her way to meet us, so our worries about fuel would be over. Hope sprouted anew. I could not help remembering my conversation with Mihaj. Didn't we still have a good chance of making Zonazer? What was to stop us from outrunning the enemy? We got the answer to that question around 20-30 hours. Aircraft alarm. No sooner had the report that 16 planes were approaching run through the ship than they were flying over us at high altitude. Then they were out of sight and the order was given Off-duty watch dismissed. Anti-aircraft watch at ease at the guns. At ease but not for long. In a few minutes another aircraft alarm was sounded and this time it was a different picture. The planes dived out of the clouds individually and in pairs and flew towards us. They approached even more recklessly than the planes from the Victorious had done two days earlier. Every pilot seemed to know what this attack meant to Tavi. It was the last chance to cripple Bismarck so that the battleships could have at her. And they took it. Once more Bismarck became a fire-spitting mountain. The record of her anti-aircraft guns was joined by the roar from her main and secondary turrets as they fired into the bubbling paths of incoming torpedoes, creating splashes ahead of the attackers. Once more, the restricted field of my director and the dense smoke allowed me to see only a small slice of the action. The antique looking swordfish, 15 of them, seemed to hang in the air, near enough to touch. The high cloud layer, which was especially thick directly over us, probably did not permit a synchronized attack from all directions. But the swordfish came so quickly after one another that our defense did not have it any easier than it would have had against such an attack. They flew low, the spray of the heaving seas masking the landing gear. Nearer and still nearer they came into the midst of our fire. It was as though their orders were, get hits or don't come back. The healing of the ship first one way and then the other told me that we were trying to evade torpedoes. The rudder indicator never came to rest and the speed indicator revealed a significant loss of speed. The men on the control platforms in the engine room had to keep their wits about them. All ahead full, all stop, all back full, ahead, all stop, were the ever-changing orders by which Lindemann sought to escape the malevolent eels. As though hypnotized, I listened for the sound of an exploding torpedo mixing with the roar of our guns. It could be much worse than it was two days earlier. A hit forward of my station could be tolerated, but what about a hit aft? There was not much distance between me and our sensitive propellers and rudders, and it seemed as though these were our attacker's favorite targets. We had been under attack for perhaps 15 minutes when I heard that sickening sound. 
Two torpedoes exploded in quick succession, but somewhere forward of where I was. Good fortune and misfortune, I thought. They could not have done much damage. My confidence in our armored belt was unabounded. Let's hope that's the end of it. Soon after the alarm, Matrosengefreiter Herzog, at his port third 3.7 cm anti-aircraft gun, saw three planes approaching from his stern at an oblique angle, while the runner at his station was reporting other planes coming from various directions. Then, through the powder smoke, Herzog saw two planes approach on the port beam and turn to the right. In no time, there were only 20 meters of our stern coming in too low for Herzog's or any other guns to bear on them. Two torpedoes splashed into the water and ran towards our stern just as we were making an evasive turn to port. The attack must have been almost over when it came. An explosion aft. My heart sank. I glanced at the rudder indicator. It showed left 12 degrees. Did that just happen to be the correct reading at that moment? No. It did not change. It stayed at left 12 degrees. Our increasing list to starboard soon told us that we were in a continuous turn. The aircraft attack ended as abruptly as it had begun. And there it is. The decisive hit to the rudder of the big ship. Bismarck's fate is now sealed and we have learned in this episode how close the Allied forces came to rediscovering her even a day earlier and how the Catalina flying boats later held constant contact. Interestingly enough, the second funnel was never used and all enemy aircraft were engaged immediately, rendering this attempted subterfuge completely ineffective. There was quite a lively discussion in the comments of the last episode about whether this dummy stack would have worked or not, with most people thinking that it wouldn't have. But then again, we have seen in this episode that the Swordfish pilots attacked HMS Sheffield, a town-class cruiser, which is considerably smaller than Bismarck and bears almost no resemblance to her. And yet, Sheffield survived only by sheer luck because British torpedoes, just like their American and German counterparts, were completely shit at the time. Anyway, on to the major question, how did the pride of the Kriegsmarine not manage to shoot down a single plane? Burkhardt himself says that he doesn't know and that the planes were probably flying too low for the AA mounts to aim towards. He also cites another author, British sailor Alistair McLean, who himself served on HMS Royalist, a Dido-class cruiser. McLean recounts an encounter with German torpedo bombers, probably ME-110s. His ship too did not manage to shoot down a single one, even though a slow-flying bomber that is directly approaching should be the easiest target to hit. But as it turns out, they aren't. In fact, even the Americans struggled during the beginning of the war in the Pacific, even though their fire control was vastly superior to that of the Japanese at the time. Only later, with radar-assisted fire control, proximity fuses and air cover, did the Americans manage to shoot down most Japanese planes in that theater. Bismarck had neither. Were the crews fatigued? Maybe, but that wasn't the only cause. It was probably a mix of different factors that ultimately led Bismarck being hit in the most vulnerable spot. Also remember, the ship was constantly doing evasive maneuvers and the sea was rolling about in every direction, which makes aiming a lot harder. Anyway, in the next episode we find out the extent of and how the damage control parties tried to fix said torpedo damage. I will see you then. Bye bye. Cheers.